Nobody Needs to Know by Double Daring Darling One, read by Kind Bed. Additional tags include PTSD, hurt comfort, nightmares, cooking, the sports festival was messed up, Vaka Gokatsuki centric, Aizawa Shoto centric. Summary Bakugo has nightmares, and because Bakugo has nightmares, he cooks. And then Bakugo may or may not leave a surprise for Aizawa. Chapter 1 Bakugo is not weak, but he's also not dumb. He knows that getting kidnapped fucks you up. He knows that almost drowning in sludge isn't something that's just going to go away. He knows that being chained up in front of thousands of people wasn't okay. It wasn't what a hero would, should, do. Bakugo Katsuki knows that all that shit happened to him anyway. He recognizes that the school didn't give him any support when he was obviously being affected. But he can't change shit. And he's not gonna act like a whiny bitch over things he can't change. So when nightmares came knocking on his door, he just punched them down again. When someone walked behind him and he felt trapped, he just put more aggression into his stance. When someone called him a fucking villain, he just snapped his jaws at them and moved on. He wasn't going to let some extra affect him. For the most part, it worked. Which, well duh. Of course it worked. It's him after all. But sometimes, just sometimes, he can't beat down the nightmares. Sometimes they scratch and scratch at the door of his mind, and he just lets them in. Sometimes he would wake up in explosive sweat-soaked sheets, and his heart would pound while his eyes scrambled in the dark of his room, looking and tensing and watching for something. He was alert, not afraid. Bakugo didn't get scared, and he was ready to blow some shit up. Except his body begged him not to. His body lagged and wore, and Bakugo knew that he couldn't. Bakugo is not dumb. He knows his limits. So he would pace and pace and pace and pace and yeah, that. He would shift and fidget and sit down and get up and then dissociate for a while, then blink back to then and there. It was okay. He was fine. But one night, Bakugo was thirsty. Like really fucking thirsty. So like the badass he was, he gathered his best get the hell away from me glare and walked to the dorm's kitchen in the dark. Now, Bakugo didn't dislike the dark. Don't get me wrong. It's just that sometimes, just sometimes, the shadows seem to lunge and dance around him, taunting him with echoes of danger. So when he got to the kitchen, he wisely turned on all the lights he reasonably could without waking anyone up. It wasn't that he was scared. It's just that when you sweat nitroglycerin and get startled, it leads to loud, unwanted explosions. He was the best in the class, and he didn't get scared over his own fucking shadow. So, Bakugo flipped on the overly confusing light switch. It's the circle type, you gotta turn, not flip. But it only works if you turn it twice. He walked to the fucking fridge, and he got his fucking water, and he turned off the lights, and he walked calmly to his room. No, he did not speed walk there. Like the UA student he is. Except, the only fault in his plan was the perfect fresh ingredients for shrimp pasta. He didn't even like shrimps. But he hesitated to turn off the lights of walking away and let the food go unappreciated. None of the other extras knew how to really cook. Well, one knows how to bake, but that's different. And the most they might attempt would be a mac and cheese. It felt like a shame to let perfectly good food and money go down the drain for nothing. And his body was moving before he could catch up. Suddenly he was pulling the shrimps and cream and pasta and garlic and cheese. And everything else he may need. It was easy to fill up the pot boil the water, season and cook the shrimp, and add the cheese and the cream. Bakugo's movements were practiced and fucking perfect. Bakugo was a great fucking cook. The pot sizzled and the shrimp smelled amazing. Well, amazing for people who like shrimp. Anyway, by the time it was plated and cooked and warmed, he felt relaxed. He was relaxed enough to panic because he couldn't eat all this wonderful food he made by himself. And someone would definitely notice if he left it in the fridge. And if they noticed, they would bug them again and again for food. And Bakugo didn't want to have to be the one who always made dinner. Because if he always made dinner, then he would have to wash the dishes. If Bakugo washed the dishes, he would be late to do homework. If he were late for homework, he wouldn't finish on time to go to bed at 8.30. If he didn't go to bed at 8.30, he wouldn't be able to take early morning runs. His whole fucking schedule would be off. Bakugo tried to calm his breathing. He would figure something out. He always did. 
It's not like he couldn't just trash it. But like hell, he would throw away something he made. It was times like these where he wished he could just hand his problems off to another. If he even had fucking problems, that is. But he doesn't, because he's fucking better than the extras. If he can't handle it, then no one can. But he could handle it just fucking fine. He suddenly had a very dangerous idea. One that just might work. I mean, if he leaves the food on Aizawa's desk, then someone would eat it, right? And they would taste how damn delicious his cooking is. And they wouldn't be able to pester him for food. The plan is fucking excellent. It's hard for Bakugo to quiet his footsteps, hard for him to slow his aggressive pace, but he manages. Manages to get to the classroom unseen, and manages to leave the food-filled container. Manages to get back to his dorm too. This time, when he shuts off the lights, he doesn't hesitate. This time, he falls asleep with no nightmares. Chapter 2. Food for Free Summary Aizawa's reaction to the shrimp pasta Aizawa doesn't like a lot of things. He doesn't like suits. He doesn't like the media. He doesn't like All Might. He doesn't like how late his shifts are. He doesn't like when his pillows flattened out too much because then it was like sleeping on the floor. And if he was going to sleep on the floor, he's going to need his sleeping bag. Aizawa especially doesn't like getting up hours before his students just so he could go to his class, set up worksheets, grade homework and tests, settle in for a nap, and then wait for the problem students to come and drag him out of his sleeping bag with their noise. It was his routine. But that doesn't mean he had to like getting up at 6am every day, especially since he's always hungry and tired during class because of late annoying shifts, not going to sleep until 3am and skipping lunch most days because of a small crime, or missing breakfast because Hizashi can't find his hearing aids. Hero work isn't everything his students think it is, and he constantly has to bite his tongue and keep his more disturbing realizations to himself. He realized quickly that in his work, in this life, you can lose everything and everyone. Aizawa knew that hero work is similar to addiction. Once you start, you need it. Need the adrenaline, the recognition, the confirmation that you are a good person. But Aizawa never said any of that. He isn't the one to comfort people. He's straightforward and blunt, and wouldn't be able to deal with the questions that would come with those dark thoughts. But despite that, early mornings are for him and his exhaustion, and his dark thoughts. So imagine his surprise when he goes to sit down at his desk and there's a container of food. Food that's still warm. Food that wasn't just a protein pack. Food that would be the first real meal in days. Food that he knows he shouldn't eat for safety reasons. But it would be okay to smell it, right? To make sure it doesn't smell dangerous. Just to make sure no one had or is cooking with harmful substances. That is the only reason. Except the moment he took off the lid, it gave off the most perfect smell. It smelled creamy and cheesy, and he's sure he should just spot his shrimp, his favorite seafood, in there. Not only did it smell good, but it was also still warm too. He knew he shouldn't eat it. It's not safe, but his stomach groaned in protest at the thought of closing the lid and putting it away. And surely, one bite wasn't that bad. Just one small taste to get him until lunch. There are even chopsticks left. So it has to be okay. His reasoning is completely logical. And damn, is that bite good. The shrimp isn't too garlicky. The noodles are creamy and cheesy. It's just too good. And it's not like there could logically be anything wrong with it. There'd been no intruder alert, so it must be safe. He ends up eating all of it, every noodle and shrimp, and he really wants to regret it. But honestly, it was so good. So maybe he spent more time theorizing who made the food than actually grading. He wants to ask for more. It can't be Momo. Despite her mental intelligence, she's hopeless in the kitchen. It can't be Kirishima. He's not the type to be able to wait for things to be done. It can't be Kaminari. The boy would be too distracted. It definitely can't be Midoriya. That problem child would try to do everything at once. Honestly, Aizawa doesn't know anyone who would have the self-control and patience other than Baku. Aizawa makes a point to leave the empty container on his desk, make sure to leave it inside of Bakugo. He knows Bakugo will take pride in the fact that he ate it all. He knows Bakugo will notice. Bakugo is loud and antagonistic, but he's also smart and observant. He will notice. When his students come in, they are welcomed by the strange sight. When his students come in, they are welcomed by the strange sight of Aizawa being awake. They watch him warily. But Aizawa just ignores them or delivers a harsh glare saved for the worst of the worst. 
He's really not willing to deal with an overly excited class today. He just wants to get through the lesson and then get his warm food. He watches Bakugo come in. The way the boy smiles is a bit more pleased than usual. He gives a nod in return, causing Bakugo's eyes to widen just a fraction. Aizawa had his own pleased smile in his mind. On the outside, he's still deadpan, if only to keep up his reputation. I know you cooked the pasta. Aizawa deadpans, straight to the point, like always. What pasta, you old man? The boy yelled, obviously flustered. It was almost funny, except he's really hungry for something real now, and Bakugo is the only one who can actually cook. Bakugo, if you continue to make my food, I'll... Aizawa didn't actually know how he was going to convince Bakugo, but he had an idea. I'll supply you, and keep it a secret from the others in class 1A. That should convince him, and it would be worth the debt in his wallet. What? No way, asshole! Bakugo snaps back, looking offended, and extremely Pomeranian-like. Of course, Bakugo always manages to surprise him. Fine, if the boy wants to play, then Aizawa isn't going to go easy. Gathering his best serious deadpan expression, he unwaveringly bluffed. If you don't, I'll expel you. Bakugo huffs and puffs and yells, but eventually has to give in. Even Bakugo's pride would surrender under the threat of losing his dream. It's not like Aizawa would ever actually expel the boy. He had too much potential and was extremely volatile, and if he was under the extreme hurt of being expelled, who would offer their hand and corrupt him? No, Bakugo was too powerful to surrender to villainy. The thought almost scared Aizawa. The lie was a bit cruel, but hey, at least he's assured a good meal. Chapter 3 Cooking and Coping Aizawa doesn't know how he ended up here. Well, he knows exactly how he ended up here. It all started when he saw ingredients open on the counter at 4 a.m. for the fourth time that week. He had ignored it the first time. He ignored it when Bakugo started to lag during the day. He ignored it the third time and the fourth, but by the fifth time, he knew something was wrong. Aizawa knew something was wrong by the dark circles under his students' eyes. By the meals, plural, delivered to his desk nowadays. And Aizawa assumed that it would be taken care of. He assumed that problem child number one would talk to problem child number two. He assumed Kirishima would find some way to pound soft carrot into the blonde's admittedly thick head. He just never thought that it would be him to talk to the boy. Aizawa had seen enough stuff to give him nightmares for the rest of his life, so it's not surprising that he does, in fact, have nightmares. Aizawa wasn't typically scared of them. He had no fear of death and knew it was coming his way, but recently his nightmares have been about his students, and no matter how much he denies it, he's terrified when every one of them reminds him of blue eyes and soft clouds when he can't help but see him in Midoriya's recklessness or Bakugo's determination. That's the issue. He sees too much of him, even after he's been gone for years. But Aizawa takes those feelings of grief and pain, and he holds on tight. He threads them into his ideology, refuses to forget. He uses it to remind himself that he can't save everyone. But if he loses this class, these bright students, Aizawa doesn't know if he could hold himself together. So when nightmares scratch and scratch at the door of his mind, he opens the door and shoves them back. And today, the only way to shove them back is to go to the dorms check the logs, sit on the couch, and wait. He's certainly not expecting to see Bakugo cooking, looking dazed and devastated. The blonde's eyes look glassy as if dissociating. Aizawa knows it's lights, at three in the morning, and by the dozens of dishes and filled containers surrounding Bakugo, it's obvious he's been at this for hours. The teen's eyes were puffy and ring red, and in the dark of the dorm's kitchen, Aizawa could see how exhausted Bakugo really was and the boy hasn't noticed Aizawa's presence, a token to his sleep deprivation. Aizawa didn't know how to deal with this. Aizawa isn't the emotional one. He's the blunt one, the one who goes straight for the point. Aizawa especially didn't know how to handle this when in his own self-destructive spiral. Because Aizawa isn't stupid. He knows the constant paranoia, the fear. What he does to himself isn't healthy. He just chooses to ignore it. And Aizawa recognizes that in Bakugo, and that scares him. But Bakugo is his responsibility, his student, his protege, his problem child, and he can't help but see disappointed blue eyes every time he thinks of walking away. Ohoro, please be proud. He just needs you to be proud, please. Bakugo, 
Stop cooking. Aizawa curses himself. Why didn't he walk away? But he also praised himself for keeping his voice steady. Bakugo jumped a foot into the air and swirled around, still holding a mixing bowl and spatula. What are you doing here, idiot sensei? For his credit, Bakugo tried to gather his usual spark, but it came out rather sad. It almost made Aizawa pity him. Almost. Aizawa didn't pity anyone, except himself. More like, what are you doing here? Aizawa asked, glaring a bit. I do believe it's past the curfew. I'm... I'm cooking, you know, for our deal. Bakugo shifted his weight and stated it like a question. Bakugo never stated anything as a question. And I need... Aizawa paused and counted the dishes in his head. Eight different dishes for breakfast. Bakugo looked away, something like shame in his face. His arms tightened around his mixing bowl. Aizawa never considered his students as small. But Bakugo looked small at this moment. Vulnerability dripping through the cracks in the bronze defenses. Softening his voice, Aizawa asks, What are you really doing here, Bakugo? I had nightmares, Bakugo whispered, red eyes looking away. It wasn't that a punch in the gut. His student, his responsibility, facing such a demon. One he battled daily. And even worse, Aizawa knew he couldn't honestly say that it got better, that it went away, because it didn't. If Bakugo thought he'd seen terrible things now, what about after he sees his friends die, or vigilantes burn, or civilians who trust you collapse in your arms? What could Aizawa say that could make this situation better? Aizawa stepped forward carefully, pulling the bowl from Bakugo's hands and placing it on the counter before asking. What was the nightmare about? I was kidnapped, and you were dead. So were the idiots, and I was being screamed at. It was my- Bakugo interrupted himself with a sob. Tears leaked from his red eyes. And Aizawa felt so, so tired, but he had already committed himself to this. And he couldn't, shouldn't walk away like a coward. Not when a student was crying. Not when they needed the help he never got. Everyone is alive, Bakugo. And you are here at UA. Safe. Aizawa couldn't quite keep his voice steady but he hoped it was close enough to be comforting. But we could die. We get attacked every Tuesday, and the villains are out for our blood. All Might isn't able to protect us, and, and... Bakugo looked away, hiding his face before continuing. His voice cracked. Am I safe? How could I be safe when I got chained up and muzzled, or when I was called a villain? Who wants to save the villain boy? Aizawa froze. He knew what happened at the sports festival was messed up. But it didn't affect Bakugo. It wasn't supposed to affect Bakugo. He was strong. He could take it. But right now, Bakugo didn't look very strong. Aizawa stumbled forward, pulling Bakugo into a hug. Bakugo shifted and grunted, trying to pull away, but Aizawa just held him closer. Held him even when his muscles wanted to flinch at the contact, even when Bakugo started weakly punching at his chest. I'm sorry about the festival, about the news, but we can protect you. I can protect you. All Might isn't the only capable hero. You and your class are strong. They will make it. Aizawa cut himself off when he heard sobs. He noticed the tight grip on his jumpsuit. Bakugo's knuckles going white. What about Izuku? Bakugo whispered, seemingly too tired to be able to call up a nickname. He always rushes into danger, and the villains are obsessed with him. How will he survive? Aizawa tightened his grip. He was also worried about the green-headed boy, but he had to say something to make Bakugo feel better. He will also make it. He has the determination of a thousand heroes on his side. He will make it. Aizawa tries to make it sound less like he's convincing himself. His legs started to tremble and he couldn't hold Bakugo up for much longer. Looking around, he spots a couch not too far away. Aizawa scoops Bakugo up by the knees and holds him in a bridal carry, making sure not to break the all hold the boy had on him. Aizawa quickly stalked over to the couch and lay down, keeping Bakugo leaning on him. He pats the boy's back in something he hopes is comforting. There's still something wrong, isn't there? I'm always so tired and sad, and I'm always angry. It's so hard to be angry, and I'm so terrified for Izuku. He's hurting himself with this, and he's keeping secrets, and the nerd is... The nerd's just... Bakugo trails off, not being able to come up with the right words. Aizawa aches, tears pricking at his own eyes. 
How can he tell this kid that he's worried too? That he's also tired and angry and sad and terrified? He can't. So instead, he holds onto the boy tighter and pulls a blanket down over them, letting Bakugo cry into his chest, who would just quickly get insulted. Shush, Aizawa says softly as he would to a feral cat. He knows that he will have to talk to Bakugo about therapy tomorrow. He knows he'll have to check the locks more than three times tomorrow too. He lets this go in favor of comforting his favorite student. Bakugo quickly cries himself to sleep, and Aizawa could escape right now, send in an anonymous letter to Hound Dog and walk away. Let this be someone else's problem, but he doesn't. Instead, Aizawa settles down for the long haul and lets himself fall asleep too. Izuku walks out of his room to the sitting room, planning on just chilling there for a bit, maybe editing his notebooks. However, he quickly walks away when he sees Bakugo and Aizawa sensei cuddling on the couch. He makes sure the rest of the class doesn't wake them up either. You have just finished listening to Nobody Needs to Know by Devil Daring Darling One or Orphan Account. If you enjoyed the story, please leave them some feedback on archive of our own dot org slash work slash three four eight three seven five eight five. And if you enjoyed my reading of the story, you can find me on Twitter at twitter.com slash kind that 